Hey guys, welcome back to another video here. My name is Ryan. Today we're going to be talking about our brushless motors and power. We're going to be looking at what happens within a brushless motor to be able to produce more power and what happens to be able to produce less amounts of power. All of those can fit very specific applications for us in our radio controlled requirements. Now we're going to break this video down into a few steps. We're going to go and first cover off exactly what sort of relationship follows our brushless motors versus power and it might be actually a little bit obvious to you. Then we're going to look at electrical parameters and how that may change when a motor delivers either less or more power. We're going to go and follow that up with a little tip that I have that you can kind of see exactly how you can predict a motor to have more power potential. And then lastly we're going to be talking about the applications of power and how you may be able to relate your radio controlled application with that. Let's get started and talk about exactly what sort of relationship power has. Now it may be quite obvious to you the relationship of output for a brushless motor. It's very similar to our internal combustion engines with the saying that goes uh, there's no replacement for displacement. The exact same idea happens within our brushless motors. If we have a larger brushless motor, that larger brushless motor has the potential to produce more power. It doesn't mean it will, but it definitely has the potential. That begs the question of why is it that a larger brushless motor can produce more amounts of power? There's three key areas as to why a brushless motor uh, would be able to produce more power by being larger. The first one is going to deal with the windings, the second is the magnets inside the brushless motor, and then the third one is going to be related to the amount of waste heat that our brushless motors produce. Uh, so when we look at copper, uh, the windings within our brushless motor, a larger motor can have more copper inside of that particular motor. Same thing with our magnets. We can have more permanent magnets inside our brushless motor. Now when both of these things are interacting as they're being as the motor being spin up, spun up, we can see that we can get more potential out of that motor with more copper and magnets because we can produce a greater amount of force within that motor. A larger motor means we get more of that relationship, the magnetic force happening within the motor to produce us the torque. As long as we take that torque and create a dynamic relationship with it, we can then produce an overall power output. Now when we look at the third component that we just talked about, waste heat, a larger motor is fully capable of removing a greater amount of waste heat. If you were to consider our brushless motors typically being about 80 to 90 percent efficient and we consider a 500 watt motor versus a 5000 watt motor and we're looking at a 90 percent efficient motor that means 10 percent of the 500 watts of power for that motor is going to be produced as waste heat. That waste heat is going to be about 50 watts. Now if you've ever held a 50 watt soldering iron before, you know that it gets extremely hot. That's a lot of waste heat that we need to get rid of. Now the same thing with our 5000 watt motor, 10% of the 5000 watts is going to be 500 watts of power. Getting rid of 500 watts of waste heat is again a very difficult challenge for us. The only good way of doing that is by going to a larger surface area, therefore our motor is larger, it can get rid of that waste heat a lot easier. Uh, so that's exactly how those work into the equation. Now the other thing that I wanted to go over is exactly how uh, the, our parameters look. So when we talk about our parameters we're going to be looking at the KV value, the IO value, and also the RM value of our brushless motor. These are the common ones that you will see on spec sheets or data sheets of brushless motors. Now KV, as long as you are going and in increasing in power potential and you go you know, starting around the 100 watt motor versus our 10,000 watt motor, you will notice that as the motors increase in physical size, the KV value is going to actually decrease. Now this isn't necessarily the relationship that holds true in all circumstances, but it is the general trend. As you do increase in motor size, our KV value is going to go down. Now this actually works naturally great for us. The reason why is we are able to produce that power using a higher voltage. Our larger motors typically end up getting fed a higher voltage to them. Because the KVs are lower, it's going to work better with that higher voltage. This relationship kind of lends its hand into being able to provide us with motors that can produce a lot of power with our higher voltages. 
Now, when we look at the IO value and the RM value, this does not necessarily mean that a larger motor is going to have different RM values or IO values. The RM and the IO value is very specific to the amount of current that you're going to be able to push through that specific motor. If you're going to be able to produce more power with a voltage only, you don't need the RM value and the IO values to increase. If you're going to be producing more power out of a particular motor, the IO and the RM values don't necessarily need to change all that much. You will typically see if you go and put this, you know, on the on the lowest threshold and the highest threshold and you're comparing some very very different size physical size motors, IO of the motor will typically increase and the RM of the motor would typically decrease. Bigger motors are going to have less resistance in them, be able to produce a lot of power by running a lot of current through them. That's what you would typically see. Now in our RC, our, in our RC applications, the domain is going to be a little bit more restricted and we don't necessarily always see this relationship happen. For the most part it is true, but it doesn't always happen to the extent that I'm kind of referring to in this video. That's what you'll see. Now for the tip that I have for you today, when we're talking about brushless inrunners, there is a way that you would be able to estimate the potential that that brushless motor has in terms of its power output. We do know that the physical size of the motor is what's related to the power potential output of that brushless motor. If you have an inrunner that weighs less than 150 grams, you would be able to theoretically get the the continuous power output by multiplying the, si the physical weight of that motor by three. If your motor is greater than 150 grams, you'd be able to multiply the weight of that motor in grams by about four. And this is what's gonna give you the continuous wattage of that motor. Now keep in mind that this is just an estimation. Uh, for our inrunners, it should be fairly conservative. It does depend on many different factors like the quality of the motor, versus uh, other factors that would also get in the way of this relationship working. But in general, if you wanna know approximately what you're working with, that is how you'd be able to land an equation there to predict the amount of power output you can get out of that motor. Now for outrunners, it's a little bit lower. If you're gonna be looking at 150 grams or less, you probably wanna be considering multiplying the weight by about 2.5. And then there are larger motors above 150 grams is gonna be about three three is going to be your multiplication ratio that is how to just approximate the amount of power output you can get based off of a physical size again if i'm a brushless motor manufacturer and i produce my motors out of three eighths thick steel you know for our outer case you're going to have a completely different number that's going to not make sense to follow that relationship so keep in mind this is just a general idea of how you can understand uh, the brushless motor that you're dealing with and its potential for power output. And we are talking about continuous rated power. Now, in terms of applications, this is where it gets interesting because this is how we are able to relate our brushless motor's physical size with our applications. I'll give you two examples. We'll go through the cars. We'll go through uh, trainer style airplanes. If you were to consider cars, you would typically see somewhere around a 1 16th scale to maybe 1 12th scale using a 28 millimeter motor. As we move into a 1 10th scale radio control car, truck, you're going to get into motor sizes that are around 36 millimeters in diameter uh, by around maybe 50 to 60 millimeters in length. When we move into 1 8th scale applications, you'll see 36 to 40 millimeter diameter motors with a motor length of 60 to about 80 millimeters in length. Then finally, when we move into our 1 5th scale, we need a lot of power to push these heavier vehicles across the ground, through the grass, and that sort of thing. We're going to be looking at motors that have anywhere from a 40 millimeter diameter with a long can size or a 56 millimeter motor with up to around an 80, 90 millimeter length. That's kind of how you are able to see exactly what sort of motor your application would require in radio control cars. It's not a clear cut approach. There is some experience that is needed to understand what you're trying to do. If you're trying to get a lot more speed or power potential out of the motor, you're going to be want wanting to pick a motor size on the larger size of what we just talked about. Now let's shift gears and talk a little bit about airplanes and how we can relate power with our airplanes and the size of our airplane as well. 
if you are looking at an airplane that is a trainer style, so this is a high wing radio controlled airplane, you can easily predict the performance by using an amount of power per pound of weight that that airplane has. If our airplane is going to, if you were looking for adequate power to fly the airplane, you may be at 50 watts per pound. If you're looking for a decent amount of power to fly the plane well, you're looking in the range of about 75 to 100 watts of power per pound. A little bit more than that, you can still get a plane that flies really well. It starts to get a little bit, you know, on the performance oriented side as you increase beyond and above that. If you're looking for pure performance and you want to have like unlimited vertical, you're going to be up around 150 watts per pound and that's what's going to be able to do it for you with a little bit of tweaking here and there. How do we use this now for our application? Well, we can consider if we were to have a 10 pound plane and we're trying to size a motor to that, we would look at about 100 watts per pound. Therefore, we can take our 10 pound plane, multiply that by our 10 watt, 100 watts per pound, and we're gonna get a requirement of around 1,000 watts total from our motor. Then we can use our ratio of using the 1,000 watt divided by about four, and our motor for an in-runner size would be about 250 or so grams. If we use an outrunner motor, which is gonna be more applicable for radio-controlled airplanes, we're gonna to have to use a ratio of around three. We're gonna be looking at a motor that weighs somewhere in the neighborhood of 300, to 350 grams. That is how you could use these very simple general guidelines to understand exactly what size motor we would need for our specific applications. From there, you're gonna to wanna to look at the specifications that the manufacturer provide to make sure that you're gonna be able to achieve what you have predicted. Lastly, what you wanna do if you're still not certain, you wanna jump on a forum and ask the questions to the people of the forum who are flying the planes that you're flying or driving the cars that you drive to make sure that you are not putting the wrong motor into your system. You've done all the legwork, you figured it out, now you just want that confirmation to make sure that you remain confident in your choices. That's exactly how you're able to select a motor based on the power potential of that motor for your specific application. Now, I hope you enjoy this video. Don't forget to hit that like button if you do like the video and don't forget to subscribe so that I can see you in that next one. Thank you for watching.